chapter 6, but we're going backwards to chapter 6. And this is 6.1, which is volumes using cross sections. So first thing we're going to do is look at, so volumes are obviously three-dimensional, so we need to attempt to draw three-dimensional objects, which is not easy to do. So I'm going to start out with something easy to draw, which is a cone. Probably drawn cones before. So draw, we're going to do a sideways cone here. So this is supposed to be a three-dimensional object. So we're going to cone, and we're going to slice it with uh, parallel planes. So a real-world example is this looks a lot like a carrot, and you cut a carrot with a knife. And you probably cut it parallel, more or less, each time. So it's basically what we're doing right here, cutting up a carrot. So when you draw a parallel plane, you could draw a plane like this, cutting through, but the mark it's going to leave, or the cut it's going to leave, is going to look actually like that when it cuts through. So you got a plane, cutting it, and it's going to leave a what looks like a circle where it cuts. I don't really want to draw that plane there, so I'm going to take that back out. So we're going to cut like that, and here is our x-axis. We have some initial x-value, some maximum x-value. So we'll call the last one, we'll call the first one x0, the last one xn, and if we cut into n pieces, uh, I actually want to cut out an actual section here. So how many pieces do we cut it into? We're going to cut it to n pieces. So this is somewhere in between, some cuts in between. We'll call this one x k minus 1 and this one will be x k. So those are two consecutive cuts right there. So this gets into the idea of the Riemann sums where we add up the estimated area by breaking it into small pieces. So we did that briefly in Calculus 1. We drew a bunch of rectangles and cut things into rectangular pieces and then added up areas. So we're going up a dimension now. When we slice this object up, this three-dimensional object, the cross sections are going to be, instead of small areas of rectangles, these are going to be small volumes right here. And the width, we will still pay attention to the width. That's going to be super important. We'll call that delta x. If they're not all the same, you need to write delta xk, but for us, they're all going to be the same. So we'll call them all delta x. So that'll be the change in x. So let's write a volume, an estimate for the volume. So it's an estimation, so we'll use that little squiggly equal sign, which is approximately equal. So we're going to make an estimate here. So we have summation k equals 1 to n. And we have area multiplied by width. So, and again, summation is just you add up, starting at 1, going up to n. So the first one is ax1 delta x plus a x2 delta x plus a x n times delta x. So that is summation notation right there. Just means start at 1, go up to, start at 1, go up to n, and you're adding as you go. So that is summation. <coughs> what is a x? 
So AXK is the area of the K kth piece. So what does a kth piece look like? We drew a picture of it right here. So let's redraw that piece. Oh no, my dot dotted sides are not correct. So if we cut this into small enough pieces, this would look a whole lot like a what would that be? What I'm looking for, something like prism, it has a base and then it's that exact same shape as you move over. So if our delta x was super tiny, you could look at a of xk, I'll shade in that area right here. That's going to be the area of the slice, or probably surface area. So whatever part you cut with your knife, the actual amount that you cut will be A. Does that make sense? In this picture, it'll be the right side, right here, which in this case happens to be a circle won't always be a circle you uh, it'll be some type of a it'll be some area because it'll be fl uh, flat so what we're going to do is take that surface area and then multiply it by the thickness which is delta x so we're going to take that surface area and multiply it by delta x so this is an approximation for the area of this why is it an approximation because this is not perfectly shaped like a cylinder. This is a little smaller on one side, a little bigger on the other side. However, if I cut it into 10,000 pieces, the difference in the areas on each side would be really small. That's the idea. You cut it into small enough pieces and it won't matter what side you look at to get the area. Yeah. Which side are you taking? Are you taking from the smaller side or the bigger side? Uh, it doesn't matter because what we're going to do is take a limit very soon anyways. Uh, the way I drew it, I'm taking it from the bigger side, the right side. I could, so I started at 1 and went to n. I could have started at 0 and went to n minus 1 if I wanted the uh, left side in that case. And so if I went with the left side, my first area would actually be 0 right there. And if I go with the right side, my first area would use whatever that tiny little cut is that I drew right there. So doesn't matter which side you go, either way you have an approximation. But what we're going to do is take the limit. So we're going to cut it into an infinite number of pieces, so it won't matter which side that we uh, are taking left or right. Now it's hard to imagine infinite pieces, but I think you can probably imagine cutting this into 10 pieces is pretty much how I have it partitioned off. And you could probably imagine cutting into 100 pieces. Maybe if you cut into 1,000 pieces, they'd be the thickness of a sheet of paper. That thousand page book might be, oh, you're looking at that overhead. That's a lot more than a thousand page book right there. That's probably like a 10,000 page book that's that wide. So that'd be it. But I think you can definitely see if you cut it the thickness of a page of a book, it wouldn't matter what side you measure the area on. I think we'd all agree with that. And in fact, throwing away one of those pages wouldn't really make a big difference. So that's how you want to think. Just think as small as you possibly can, and then think well, a whole lot smaller. So it doesn't matter if we're talking about thickness of a page of a book. That's pretty small. And that is infinitely far away from infinitely small. All right, so there's our volume. So the actual volume, to not get an estimate, we take the limit. What variable do I want to send to infinity? N or K? So we want 
not n pieces, we want infinite pieces. So we had n pieces before. K is the name of each individual piece as we go through. Uh, K is what we call a dummy variable, meaning that I could erase K here and K and put in any other letter that I'm not already using. So J is another letter you're going to see sometimes. They use I's. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen other letters too, but those are the common ones. So we're take this limit and this limit is equal to the integral regular a of x. The delta x turns into dx and we're starting at a and going to b. So starting x values a, ending x values b, and we take the limit of this summation, we're going to get the integral ax dx. And that is what you need for volume. So volume is the integral a to b, ax dx, where ax equals the surface area of the cross section with the plane let me put a little x naught with the plane x equals x naught So whatever of these x values you're thinking of, just think of the cross section. We're just going to measure the area. For example, here's ak minus 1, that what I just shaded in. That would be ak minus 1. So the only difficult thing to do, this volume formula is not very difficult to remember. You can put it on your cheat sheet. The difficult thing is going to be to write the formula for ax. That's going to be the hard part when we do these integrals, or when we set these integrals up. So we're going to spend most of the time looking at how do we get the formula. So the procedure we're going to do is we're going to sketch a solid region and then sketch cross-section and try to figure out how are we going to relate the area of the cross-section to uh, what we drew. So why doesn't that create a cone instead? I mean, a oh, it does cylinder. Uh, it would be a cylinder if the area was constant across every single cross-section. Okay, so what in that equation, the integral you gave us? I haven't written down a, a formula for a, AX. Uh, it would probably look something like pi something squared. Okay. Uh, pi r squared is the radius of a circle. You just have to figure out how big the radius is at different points here. Oh, so we haven't gotten to that. We haven't gotten to that oh, yet. Okay. So this one would definitely be circles or cross sections, so it would be something like pi r squared. You just have to figure out the formula for r in terms of what x is. Um, and I can tell you from looking at this, it's going to be a linear function uh, starting at A you get 0 and at B you would have to figure out what is that measurement right there. At B you would get that value and then it would be a linear function in between. I don't think we actually do that exact problem, we do some problems that are pretty similar. Alright, so let me write that procedure that I stated. So sketch the solid region. A lot of times it's easier said than done. And a cross section. It's important to sketch the cross section so you can see is it a circle, is it a square, is it a triangle, is it something even weirder than that. So you get a cross section, you'll have some idea of what shape you're dealing with. A lot of times it's going to be pretty basic geometric shape. 
Uh, then you find the formula for AX. <coughs> And then limits of integration. So it'll be some interval A to B, biggest and smallest X value. Unless we're using Y's, then it'll be Y values. And then of course you integrate. From A to B, A, X, DX. All right, first example, a square pyramid, three meters high, with base three meters, find the volume. Now you can actually answer these volume questions experimentally. We don't usually do experiments in math, but you could build this pyramid as best you can. How can you measure volume if you don't have any type of, uh, any, any ruler, yardstick, any way to measure distance? You can still measure volume. You can always dunk things in water. So you can actually experimentally check these here. Um, of course, every measurement you take is off by a certain amount, so you never will get the actual equality that you're looking for, unless you pretend like everything works out perfectly and all that good stuff. So, we're going to look at square <coughs> pyramid three meters high. So if I draw a really, really fast sketch, square is referring to the base is a square. height with a dotted line. So that's not the best pyramid I, I could draw. I'm going to draw a much better one, but I want to draw it flipped over. So square pyramids are like the ones, at least the ones that I've seen in pictures in Egypt because of square bases. And I'm going to draw this upside down now in a much more careful way. It's important that you get the center as accurate as you can in this. Uh, you're drawing your square, but it's going to look like a parallelogram to give it perspective. And do your best to do a three meter height. So make it the same as the base. All right, that is a much better pyramid. So if I draw it like this, we're going to need an x-axis and a y-axis. So I am just going to pick the axis going straight up to be the y-axis. That'll be the x-axis over there. So I need, which way should I cut this? Should I go horizontal planes? or vertical planes. Which way do I have really good cross sections? Horizontal. The vertical ones are not horrible. They're gonna look like be some type of rhombus shape. I could do it, but horizontal is gonna give me square, 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 square. That's gonna make everybody happy, hopefully. Area of a square is easy. So let's go with horizontal cross sections. So in the procedure that I wrote, sketch solid region, check, and a cross section. So we're doing that now. So here's our cross section. Uh, just think if I slice over, what do I get? The shape I get is going to look like that. So it's going to be a square. And we're doing this with perspective, so it doesn't really look looks like a parallelogram, but it's actually going to be a square. So we have a square cross-section area equals side squared. 
The only tricky thing is, what's the side? So we all know area is side squared. So that's the easy part. The hard part is, how big is the side? <coughs> so when we have cross sections like this, the way I lined it up on the x, y axis, we actually, to cover this whole volume, we need to change our y coordinates. So this is a dy integral, the way I've set this up. So I've set this up as a dy integral. If I would have drawn my pyramid opening up to the right like this, I could have said this was a dx integral because I would do vertical cross sections then. I will show you a really nice way to figure out if you're a dx or a dy integral very soon. What I need now is to figure out how does side length relate to y value right here. So let's look back at the problem. We need to start labeling some y values. The way I drew it out, this point right here at the bottom has a y coordinate of zero. I just inverted my pyramid and said it started at the origin right there. What is the maximum up here? What is the maximum y value our pyramid has? Three, that comes from not the base, but the height. They ha both happen to be three, but the important one is the height. I'm looking at the height of three right now. So our interval, y is between zero and three. So we go between zero and three. That's our a and our b. So I want to relate side length, S, to Y. So what I really want to do is find a formula for S of Y. So I want to find a formula for S of Y. So if you tell me a Y value, I should be able to tell you how big the side is. There's two that I know for sure. What is the side length of zero? Zero. What's the other one I know? What's the other y value I know the side length for? At three, so S of three, what is our side length? Three, so we have to have a base of three, so our side length will go up to three. So S of three equals three. So S of zero is zero, S of three is three. Let's redraw this with a perspective just directly from the side. So I'm going to redraw this without trying to make it look three-dimensional. So I'm going to redraw a side view without perspective. And if you don't have perspective, they have some name for that, don't they? Iso. I think it's isometric, where you don't have the disappearing vanishing point. So if you didn't take art class, don't worry about it. We're just going to take. Uh, Actually, the ones you've got there are isometric. Is there, so that. Oh yeah. Isometric. I don't have a vanishing point, or at least I'd probably I'd have to measure more precisely. I don't, didn't really pay attention to vanishing point, uh, and all that. I didn't do so well in art class. All right, so we're going to just do a side view. So I guess all we're doing is rotating the camera that we're taking a picture with. That's all we're doing. What we get is a triangle. So what I want to know, this length right here, at some y value, this length will be s of y. So what I'm showing you is we have a linear function. 
not quadratic, it's not square root, it has a nice linear shape right here. It is a line. You could find the slope of the line if you wanted to. So it'll look like my plus b. S of 0 is 0. That tells me that, let's see, S0 of 0, so S of 0 equals 0, Y, no, not 0, Y, N times 0 plus B, so our B equals 0. Now the other point, S of 3 equals 3, S of 3 equals M times 3 plus B was 0, and this is supposed to equal 3, 3 equals 3M, m equals 1. So our s of y function equals 3y. You don't need the plus 0. But our function is just 3y. Oh, that's a very good question. There is a correct answer to that. So usually we measure the base, that entire length would be 3, right there. So he is correct, at least with the way we normally would call these things. So to avoid erasing anything, I'm just going to go 3 and just say that whole thing is 3. Because really, that's what I was thinking of, I just mislabeled. What I drew is half of a side length, which is... If I'm going for area of the ba of the actual cross section, I want the full side length times the other side. All right, so there's our function s of y is three y. So all we're going to do is put it into the volume. It is the integral a b? We have a y integral, so it's a y dy, just like that. Our y values go 0 to 3. A y. Ooh, I didn't find a y yet, did I? I just found s of y. So s of y equal. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, because I'm. I got the m value down here, and then I wrote 3 right there. Not good. Good thing I'm not in charge of the pyramids. They would not have been made very precisely. Zero to three. All right. A y equals s squared, which is in our case y squared. There we go. Questions? <coughs> this is your first volume integral, so it shouldn't make perfect sense yet. If it is, you're paying too much attention. But y cubed over 3, 0 to 3 equals 3 cubed over 3 minus 0 cubed over who cares? 9 over 3. Is that 3? Seems like it. All right. Does anybody know the air volume of a square pyramid off the top of their head? So it probably is like a base squared and a height times some some constant. All right. Good enough. So there's our first example. The examples we're going to do at the beginning actually will seem more difficult than when we do rotations later on, because the rotations are more regularly shaped. So there's a lot less thinking involved with your cross sections. Cross sections at some point will either be uh, circles or cylinders. But for now, when things are not just rotations, uh, things can be a little more difficult. Yes, sir.
Uh, so the area is S squared, the side length squared, area of a cross section. We drew, yeah, right there. So we had a square cross section right here, square cross section, so area was S squared. So I took that S in terms of Y, which ju just happened to be S equals Y, and then squared it. Yeah. Absolutely. <coughs> squared. So next problem. A curved wedge is cut from a cylinder of radius three. by two planes. So one plane is perpendicular to the axis. To the cylinder's axis. Uh, the other plane cuts the first plane at a 45 degree angle. At the center of the cylinder. Find the volume of the wedge. So we're going to draw a rough sketch at the beginning, and then we're going to draw a much more careful one that will be the one we're going to try to draw all of our measurements on, or label all of our measurements. So I'm going to draw my cylinder vertically here. The axis of the cylinder runs straight through the center. First plane cuts it at perpendicular to the axis. So I think it makes sense to take our first plane to be either the top or the bottom. So let's just go with the bottom as the first plane. So we'll say the plane is basically the floor of my drawing right here. So there's plane one right there, just cuts through as the floor. Plane two intersects the plane one cut at the center of the circle and makes 45 degrees. So the second plane is gonna cut in at a 45 degree angle right here. So that angle is 45 degrees. Now, what we're going to do is try to draw this much better. <coughs> There's sort of two dimensional and three dimensional things being drawn here. So we're going to redraw it all in three dimensions, super carefully. So the radius was three, so there's three right there. The height I'm drawing is three. So 
So if we take a, so what shape is this? Almost the shape of an apple wedge, except the outer side of it doesn't have the rounded in the other direction. So if you stacked up, if you tried to make some type of a apple shape with a bunch of these, the sides wouldn't totally <coughs> match up perfectly. So what I'm trying to do, maybe I should go back here and show you what I'm trying to draw. So there's the base right there. And then the other cut that this plane makes will look like that. So there's the shape that I'm that I tried to redraw. How do we know when it's made that versus like the center of the cylinder pipe was? So I knew they were from the problem it said they intersected at the oh. uh, axis of the circle. So that's how I knew they were both going to hit at that point. And then I knew it was a 45 degree angle that they intersected at. So it would have to look like this. Now you might say, how do I know it didn't intersect uh, at that 45 degree angle down there? The answer is it would have the same volume if I flipped it over. So I could have drawn the whole thing sort of upside down in this area, but it would have the same volume. So I just picked and went the other way. Now we get to decide how to slice this thing up. So let's talk about some ways to do it. What if I sliced it and we'll label X and X axis and Y axis will be going back like that. What if I cut parallel, I make all my cross sections parallel to the X, Y axis, or parallel to the X, Y plane? I'll start out with the half circle, but what in the world will I have when I get up near the top? It'll be some weird shape. It won't quite be a half circle anymore. What if I cut, let's see, perpendicular to the Y axis? So I start making cuts kind of like that. It's going to be a triangle. Actually, that may work. It's not the one we're going to use, but that looks like it might actually work. I think we would get, and if we look carefully, I think we would get triangles, and they would actually be, seems like they would be isosceles, two sides the same. So I think we could cut it that way. But there's an even easier way to cut it. What if I cut perpendicular to the x-axis? So I pick an x value right here, and I want to cut perpendicular to the x-axis. So I'm going to draw my cross section, cuts through here, and it goes up a little bit there, up a little bit. And that will be a rectangle. That sounds very good. Go for rectangles if you can. So let's cut this way. Because of my, there's my cross section right there. From this, I can determine if it's a dx or dy integral. In order to cover this entire shape right here, what I have to do with my cross section is change the x coordinate to cover my entire region. Because I have to change my x coordinate, it means this is an x integral. So the way I've set it up, I have to change my x coordinate of my cross section so this is a dx integral. The way you can think about that, dx, just remember that corresponded to delta x. What was delta x? Delta x was basically the width of your cross section. Delta x is super tiny in when we take our limit, but the width of it is measured in x's, not in y's. Now I'm drawing it as a single plane, not a plane that has a thickness because we're drawing as if I just sliced it out um, and it didn't have any thickness. So that thickness would be dx. All right, area. 
of x. So it looks like width times height. That's how we do rectangles for area, width times height. So I need a width and I need a height. And that'll be height and that'll also be width. So I need a w of x and an h of x. So a function w of x and a function h of x. All right, w of x, the width is going to be more difficult. So let's do the height. It's going to be way easier. What is the height at x value 0? How tall is our wedge at x value 0? Zero? 0. It's got 0 height way out here. 0 height right there. So h of x is the height at whatever our x value is. So we know h of 0 is 0. How about another? What other x value do I know about? 3. I know it's also 3. h of 3 is 3. And it's going to be a linear function. The height is a linear function. You can kind of see it happen right here in our first picture. You can see the height is going to be going up at this constant rate right here. I'm pointing to this dotted line that I'm making really, really bold right now. That height, that dotted line that I just redrew is the height. And it starts at 0, goes up to 3, and it goes up constant rate. So a linear function. Unfortunately, the width is very not a linear function. Some type of circular function. Ooh, circle. How do we write the equation of a circle? We got a circle on the x, y axis. What is the equation for the circle? Come on, pre-calculus one. The equation of the circle. Standard form has h and a k in it. It's got some squared stuff, and it's got a radius. Standard form of circle. Yeah. Good. Our center is 0, 0. So h is 0 and k is 0. So our circle is x squared plus y squared equals our radius is 3. So we have 3 squared. I want a function of x. So I need a function of x. So I need to solve for y. So I want to write y as a function of x. y equals 9 minus x squared square root. And I have to decide plus or minus. The way I drew this, I want to go with b positive So I would be measuring that right there. That'll be how y relates to x. So whatever the y value is, or I should over here. That part that I darkened in right there, that is how y relates to x. So if you're thinking of an x value, Right there, you're like, oh, I want one half, for example. You could figure out what y value you have right in this side of this equation right here. So you can plug in any x value between, obviously, 0 and 3. You're going to have problems if you plug in 4. Circle doesn't have the point 0.4 in it. You're going to have an imaginary number if you plug in 4. So we're not going to do that. And I'm going to go with plus. So y is 9 minus x squared square root. 
the problem is the base of my, or the width of my rectangle is actually not just y, but y this direction and y the other direction. So the base is actually 2y. So the width of the triangle is going to be 2y, which is 2 square root 9 minus x squared. And h of x is, oh, I didn't even write h of x down, h of x is a x. So I'll write it as 2x square root 9 minus x squared. So ready to put in the volume formula, integral a b ax dx. Integral ax is 2x square root 9 minus x squared dx. And a and b, where do we start and end? Our smallest x value is 0, the biggest one is 3. So this one again goes 0 to 3. How do I actually get the, how do I take the integral of this? crazy looking function. So you could use uh, one of, let's see, not tangent, cosine? Yeah, this would be a cosine or a sine, whichever of the two is on your formula page. So I could go with the cosine. What else can I do that's way easier? U substitution. This is a really, it's a perfect U sub, look at this. Doesn't get better than this for a u sub. u is 1 minus x squared, so negative 2x dx is du. So you're pretty much right there in a u sub. This is super easy once you see the u sub. So I'll just write u equals 9 minus x squared, dot, dot, dot. You know, you gotta find du. 